Good morning. My name is Justin Brown. I serve in two capacities. One is the Secretary of Human Services for the state of Oklahoma, and the other is the Agency Director for the Department of Human Services. To give a little context, the Department of Human Services uh, enjoys a workforce of about 6,000 employees. We are the, num the, the state's largest agency by workforce. Uh, we also serve about 1.5 million Oklahomans a year, so a third of the state's population utilizes the services of the Department of Human Services. So you can see uh, a really incredible um, area of influence that we have uh, here in the state of Oklahoma. In 2019, when I began at the agency, we launched an effort called Finding Our True North. And the opportunity for us was really to define sort of those reasons that we were here. Why do we have 6,300 employees? We have a budget this year of just over $4 billion. Where does that money go? Uh, we wanted to make sure that the passionate people that work at DHS are really aligned in, the, in moving forward in the same direction to serve the people of the state of Oklahoma. So the, the True North resulted in three to five uh, guiding philosophies for each of our program divisions. Uh, you may think of the Department of Human Services as a child welfare agency, which of course we are, but relevant to this conversation, uh, the Adult and Family Services Division is probably the one to highlight the most. That's where we operate the social safety net for the state of Oklahoma. So you might think of that historically as, as welfare programs, but they've changed dramatically over the years and really have an opportunity to change in even more ways to better serve the people of the state of Oklahoma who are living in poverty. So we embarked upon this mission of finding our true north. And re again, relevant to this conversation, I wanted to highlight a cup, quickly highlight a couple of our true north philosophies that are agency-wide, not specific to individual divisions, but for the entire agency. So the first one is becoming the largest ever hope-centered organization. And that this concept of the science of hope, which we'll get into here in just a minute, really is the framework that we will use and have used at the Department of Human human services for the last couple of years to think about big issues like poverty and child abuse and those sorts of things. And then the second one is to remove systemic barriers that keep our customers from accessing resources and services and for them to reach their own definition of success. You all probably understand those barriers. Those are transportation barriers and language barriers and technology barriers and child care barriers. They're everywhere. Uh, and honestly, now being in the system, it's almost impossible to imagine navigating all of those barriers to support your family's goal of success. So it's our intent to eliminate those barriers for the people that we serve. So in preparing for this conversation, I uh, built a little bit of a mission statement for us today. So I hope you'll, you'll follow me along this mission. I've highlighted a couple of key points here, um, but ultimately the mis mission statement reads, as the largest hope-centered organization in the nation, which I believe we are, the Oklahoma Department of Human Services is addressing poverty and the state's social determinants of poor outcomes through a revolutionary new human services distribution model. This distribution model will allow OKDHS to meet those that we serve where they are with the interventions that they need and will change the face of poverty in Oklahoma through the fundamental principles of hope. It's a big statement, but there are three components that we're gonna highlight today. And I'm gonna start with, the, with a construct around poverty, a, an illustration, a way I think is a really appropriate way to begin to think about poverty. So we're gonna do this together. I've started to think about poverty through the lens of the, the game Shoots and Ladders. And I, I don't know if you all remember Shoots and Ladders from your childhood, but if you do, there are boxes along the game board. And through uh, the science of hope, we understand there's some common terminology. So those boxes in the, the conversation around poverty and on Shoots and Ladders uh, really are the goals that we set for ourselves and our families. They're different for each one of us. Uh, you may have one goal that's different from my goal, and, but the boxes along Shoots and Ladders are, are uh, goals in our lives. In some cases, there are ladders that take us multiple levels up the game board. I mean, it may take us four or five, and, and in the, the conversation around poverty, um, and this safety net, those ladders are, uh, represent 
a big changes, positive changes in our lives, like a new job or a, a new educational attainment. Sometimes it's a marriage, you know, these sort of big events in our life that take us up higher. And in some cases, of course, there are shoots that take us, in many cases, all the way down to the bottom of the game board. And many times those are individual circumstances or events that occur in our lives that we have had no control over. Those may be a loss of a job or a death in the family or a catastrophic health emergency or a worldwide pandemic. Those, those things that really we can't control, but the result of them take us all the way to the bottom of the game board. I see the social safety net today that we operate. Those are programs like SNAP, which you also called food stamps, um, energy assistance, housing assistance, those sorts of programs are a one-size-fits-all net that sit under the chutes and ladders game board. And they catch us from physically perishing and they put us back on to the bottom of the game board. In reality, I think that the social safety net should be a custom safety net that follows us wherever we go so that it catches me if something occurs as close to that space in which I've started or I've ended to, and puts me right back on to the game board. There's a number of reasons that's important and I think a lot of those are intuitive. Ultimately, that's dignifying for me. I've worked my entire life to get to space 43 and one event can take me all the way to space three and I have to start over. That's not a dignifying experience. Secondly, it's multi-generational. Uh, if you can imagine my kids starting from the shoulders of somebody who, who is on Space 43 versus Space 3, it gives them a completely different understanding of the world and dip, completely different experiences. And then the third reason is, it is a, it's more efficient for taxpayers, for the government, and it's easier. So it's a lot cheaper for our systems to catch somebody here with the specific intervention that they need rather than catching them here and getting them all the way back up to where they were. So there's lots of reasons it's important. Now, that's the easy part, is explaining how it should look. The difficult part is explaining potentially how we get there, and that's really this massive transformation. And so, uh, there are two components to a rebuilt social safety net, in my opinion. First is the actual resources that we provide. So those are workforce training programs, educational programs, those are the SNAP benefits and the energy assistance. We should rethink how all of those systems work together because they were developed in silos and they still primarily work in silos. The work that we're doing today and that I'm going to explain today through the context of the science of hope is a rebuilt distribution model for those resources. It really is how we get those programs that we operate to the people that need them when and where they need them, the new distribution model for human services. So I wanted to anchor us in this illustration around poverty so that we could now begin to look at the science of hope through that, with that basic understanding, and we can look at a rebuilt social safety net, uh, specifically the distribution model. All right, so um, a few sort of uh, uh, anchoring words in the science of hope for us, uh, or, or concepts. So uh, hope is the belief that tomorrow can be better than today, and I have the power to make it so. That's what dis dis uh, distinguishes a, the, the science of hope from a wish. The, the thought that the future can be better than today is just a wish. But if you add agency to it, this, this idea that I can control this path ahead of me, that's where we turn into the science of hope. So it's important to note that hope is measurable. Um, we, can, we can not only measure and identify hope in individual people, we can measure collective hope in groups. And because it's measurable, we can also impact somebody's hope score. So to give you a little, one data point, um, in um, the, a, a child's hope score is based out of 36 points and a two point increase in a child's hope score has been proven with thousands of studies to represent a uh, letter grade increase in school. So just two points improves a, a child's uh, outcomes. And the, the second thing to think about in the context of this new distribution model is that hope begets hope. 
one piece, one uh, element of success, one improvement in one area builds momentum towards additional, um, additional elements of momentum. So there are three components to the science of hope that are important to understand. And this will all make sense. I think the science of hope really brings all of this together in giving us a better understanding for, um, for how we impact these big systems. So the first is goal setting. It's this concept that there is something out there for me that is better than I have today. It's something out there that I can see. The second is the creation of a series of pathways. So not only can I see that better future, but I can also see a path that I can take from where I stand to that better future. There is a pathway that exists for me to reach those goals. And then the third is this concept of, of willpower and, and agency, that I have the control over that. And so I can see this goal out there, I can see a pathway, and I will not stop until I reach that goal. That is, those are the three fundamental components of the science of hope. So I think as we walk through this new distribution model, you'll see where we're bringing in all of these elements into a, an on-the-ground distribution effort uh, to address poverty. So I'm gonna to touch on, the, so this is really the, the crux of the situation here. We're working and utilizing the science of hope and those three core elements in rebuilding a distribution model. I mentioned we have 6,300 employees at the Oklahoma Department of Human Services. That doesn't count the hundreds and thousands of partners that we have across the state. So the alignment of our workforce alongside these incredible partners is the, the concept of the people adjustment to the distribution model. Um, if you are, if you can imagine what a government, um, uh, what interaction with government has historically looked like, and in many cases today still looks like, you uh, can imagine a dark building with a piece of glass and hundreds of employees behind that piece of glass, and I walk in the door and I engage on this side. That is absolutely how it looked in the past, and in most cases how it looks today. We have closed 41 of our 92 offices because that is not the appropriate way to engage with our communities. It requires, if you think about that shoots and ladders um, illustration, it requires somebody to fall all the way to the bottom to meet this level of despair to reach out to state government for help. That's the, the, that's the uh, environment that we're in today. We've closed these buildings because we're going deeper into our communities. We have now embedded hundreds of employees, the, our, uh, so much of our workforce, in with those community partners that I talk about. So now you see Oklahoma Department of Human Services, social safety net employees embedded in homeless shelters, in hospitals and law enforcement offices, anywhere that our customer is we want to meet them so that we can solve for their needs before they become in crisis. That's the effort to make. So our team had been somewhat handcuffed to, this, to our cubicles. The house plants were gr growing around us and we'd been there for generations, but now our team is, is deployed to the community and we're continuing to layer into that. So that's the people component of a new distribution model. The next component is the places component. So of course embedded workers have to go somewhere, but further we have to rethink a co-locating type of platform for government services. So, so uh, we have, in, during, in the early stages of the pandemic, we launched a model called Community Hope Centers, and the idea was to wrap resources around youth development providers so that when kids weren't able to be served in schools because they were closed, we could serve them in a community hope center. So I'll give you one quick number to illustrate the issues that we saw in the beginning stages of the pandemic. In April of 2019, one year before the pandemic, just the month of April, we received 767 calls to the child abuse and neglect hotline from educators alone. In the month of April 2020, one year later, the first full month of the pandemic, 
we received 57 calls. We were down 710 calls from educators to the child abuse and neglect hotline. Of course, that's because schools were closed and that support structure that had been developed over the generations to identify abuse and neglect was no longer there for our kids and families. The Hope Center platform intended to solve that problem. We, we worked with providers like Boys and Girls Clubs, Urban Leagues, YMCAs all over the state and stood up 52 Hope Centers to support kids and families when and where they need it by wrapping resources around them. So we are now provided mental health interventions, food resources, uh, social safety net embedded workers so that we could solve for the systemic resource needs of families. So we, that was the first iteration. We have now opened the first ever Workforce Hope Center. And um, that is this building right here. It opened here in Oklahoma City. And the idea is to evolve our model beyond the youth development um, model that, that now is not so relevant because schools uh, are back open and functioning in that structure that had been built for generations. But now the idea is to wrap resources around workforce programs. So these workforce programs allow for somebody essentially experiencing homelessness to walk in the door, to meet with somebody who can help them through career pathways. They can get work readiness programs, GED, ESL programs, all of those programs that are considered pathways for us in the context of the science of hope, pathways for someone to meet their goals. They can do goal setting uh, and they can experience incremental improvements in their hope scores. So that's that concept of the development of agency and willpower. So we bring together workforce services, but, but we know that the reason that do people don't engage for the long term in workforce programs is because of those barriers that exist that we intend to eliminate. So on site in Hope Centers, you, there are food resources, there are mental health interventions, there's a safety net clinic. Um, we have um, everything from parenting classes and um, health interventions, all of those programs, but you can also meet with five different government agencies to provide resources in one place. So no longer do you have to go to this building and navigate transportation barriers and go to that building, take time off, find somewhere for your kids. Those sorts of, of uh, barriers are eliminated through the Workforce uh, Hope Center platform. So this is one physical representation of the places that we in, are developing to to completely revolutionize the distribution model. And as you can see, the science of hope is core and the understanding of that science is core in the design of these models. So um, it's the, the last component of the distribution model change is a, a tremendous uplift of technology to support those critical one-on-one -on -one interventions that we provide as a state and through this platform. So uh, I wanted to share with you that the Department of Human Services is a core agency. It is, it is um, it engages with, with 1.5 million Oklahomans, a third of the state's population, in meaningful ways. And we are here to do the big things, changing the distribution model so that we can impact poverty, which I believe is the core contributor to poor outcomes in the state of Oklahoma. So with that, I say thank you, enjoy the rest of the day, uh, and have a, have a wonderful afternoon.